Familiar faces, faces in the audience. audience. Good. I, I hope you had a great lunch. lunch. Did you? So now I have something to feed your brain with. So, uh, we'll, we'll talk, talk about GPARS. How many of you know what GPARS is? <laughs> okay, half the hands. And how, of, how many of you have ever tried GPARS? Great. Uh, lovely. Now, to summarize for those who don't pass, combines Groovy and Concurrency, two of my passions, in one library. So it's a library for Concurrency in Groovy and, to some extent, in Java. Uh, it tries to present uh, high-level Concurrency abstractions, such as after state flow and others, uh, because we believe that this is a better way to write code than using the primitives that are available in, in Java, uh, like threads and synchronize and we believe that uh, high level abstractions allow you to uh, focus less on threading and locking and more on the application code that you are supposed to develop, right? That's what the client, our client is paying for. Now, how many of you have tried ever using locks, synchronization, and threads? I'm interested. Okay, and how many of you guys enjoy that? Okay, perfect. Yeah, I was hoping for at least someone. Because I need volunteers on this project, so if you could stop by after the talk, I'd be happy to talk to you. But most of you didn't. Good, so then hopefully I'll offer you something that you can use instead. Now, uh, GPAS is a multi-paradigm framework, so it offers several different abstractions. Each is good for something else. And I've heard from many people that it would be nice if we provided some guidance use GPAS, when to pick which of the abstractions, what is it good for. So this is what this talk is for. You know, I won't talk about the theoretical concept as much as I'll talk about how to use GPAS and when to pick one, of, uh, one or the other uh, concept that is available. So I did some investigation, I read books about concurrency just to figure out how people tend to categorize concurrency problems, and I came up finally with such a simple scheme, which uh, essentially distinguishes two types of concurrency problems, task parallelism and data parallelism. One of them focusing on uh, you know, the procedures, the code that you're supposed to run, and then you run different code in parallel, while data parallelism focuses on running the same piece of data on different, uh, uh, the same piece of functionality on different uh, data. Concurrently, and now depending on the dependency between tasks or data, you can distinguish other categories, hierarchical or uh, geometrical, and so on and so forth. I'd like to focus on these four yellow uh, categories, and we'll start with task, then we move to data parallelism. So unfortunately, we'll not cover everything, but I picked those categories because I believe these have the biggest value for you. First. Probably, chances are pretty high you're not familiar with them. And the second, they have very high practical value, I believe. So let's start with something we already know from Java, at least most of us. And that's asynchronous uh, oh, task parallelism with independent tasks. So you have no dependencies between those asynchronous tasks. In Java, you would do it in this way. You would create a thread pool, you would then submit all the function, all the tasks that you want to perform to that thread pool and then have that thread pool execute all your, all your tasks. How many of you have anything like that? Now in Groovy, you can do it in a slightly simple way. You just start a task and give it a closure. And that closure is the, is the task that will run uh, asynchronous um, on a thread pool. But this will use a default thread pool that Jeepers will create for you. Frequently you will want to keep control of you know, how many threads and thread pools you have in your application. So then you have to be explicit and create a parallel group of some sort and many types of them. And, and you specify how many threads you want, or you just give it an existing threat pool for the group to reuse. And then you have handy methods to create tasks and others. So this is the way to create to submit a task for processing on a particular threat pool. Now, not only closures can be passed, but also runnables and callables, so that we're kind of consistent with how things are done in, in Java. So then you can 
can imagine, you know, you have a set of tasks you want to perform. In our case, I put them in a collection, but you could have them stored any way you like. So the easiest and least overhead way to run them concurrently in NGPass is this. Sequentially iterate and then create a task for each. You know, that has the least overhead and it will run all of them concurrently. And you can continue. The main thread can go on. You don't have to wait for these to finish. But as I said, there are no dependencies between tasks. If there are dependencies, and this is pretty frequently the case, you need to do something special if you want to coordinate these tasks, or at least if you want to wait for them to finish. So that's the second category we'll talk about, is a dependent uh, um, task. And we'll start with, again, with something we're used to, and that's shared state. So if you want to coordinate multiple tasks, but you want them to communicate through shared piece of data, shared place in memory. Because you know, that's the way they thought, at least, and they taught me to write code when I was at school. So let's look at that first. So here's a piece of code that, uh, well, does exactly that. So yeah, I've got a collection of my tasks, submissions. You know, and I come each, for each submission, for each form, I start a new task. And that task will process that form, validate it, and then it's valid, it will store it in registrations list. So I want all the registrations to, uh, you know, to, to have them in that list. Now, now who thinks this is, this is fine? This is correct. OK, good. No one. No one got trapped. Obviously, this is, this is wrong. Uh, well, the state here needs some sort of protection. So even if you use GPAS task, you know, they won't magically help you. Uh, they won't magically protect you from race conditions. If you run code like this, you get pretty random, uh, pretty random results. So I've got the piece of code here, so I can run it. And you see, I get a collection that contains two nulls and then some forms. And if I run, run it again, well, I get different two, two different forms, if I remember correctly. Sometimes you get exception. Sometimes you get you know, two nulls, three nulls. So the results are non-deterministic. You never know what happens. So you need some sort of protection, and you probably have some idea how you would protect that state. Right? You would synchronize, you would put a lock there, whatever. There are many ways to protect. Uh, well, the way I want to suggest here, and the one that uh, GPAS provides, is called agent. So instead of exposing that piece of data directly to threads, you create an agent. You wrap that state uh, in an agent. Now, I wonder how many people went to my workshop yesterday. OK, all right. Quarter of the room. So, I, I'll, so I'll be repeating myself a little bit. So you have multiple tasks bombarding the, the agent with requests that they want to modify the state. But since they don't count it's the agent that manages the state. So the, the agent will take all the incoming commands and put them in a queue, serialize them, and then process them one by one. And the commands that you send to the agent have to contain the code that you want to execute on the agent in the agent's context. So the agent will take your command, give it the current state so your, your command can do anything it likes with it. Yeah, and, and then it will take another command from the list. So the state remains fast safe because there's only one entity ever accessing that piece of data. So on code level, on code level you would create an agent perhaps from the group forcing the agent to pick threads from the group when it has something to do. And then you have tasks running in parallel and then submitting closures. These are the commands. Closures to the agent. So the closure at the last line, that's the piece of code that the agent will execute. It will pass in the, the list it has at the moment, and the closure is free to do anything it likes with it. And then from the main thread, you can always ask for, you, know, you can ask the agent, hey, what is the current state of the list? So you get it from the so now you see, you can freely combine tasks and agents. They naturally fit together. Right? They're not like separate entities you can't combine. OK, so that was kind of the, uh, that was the familiar territory. Now I want to move to a territory that might be a little bit more unfamiliar to many of you. Imagine you've got tasks 
and there are some dependent dependencies between them, but these dependencies are pretty random. You, you don't know which task depends on the other. And your main thread might depend on some. I mean, somehow, you know, you have multiple tasks accomplishing bigger com computation, but you know, pieces of bigger computation that you need the overall result you know, you need to get at some point. So how to organize such, uh, such a um, concurrent algorithm? Now, for this to, uh, no, the, the underlying mechanism that we need to explain here is uh, called data flow concurrency. This is what GPOS builds on pretty heavily. So now let me introduce how data flow concurrency works. I mean, that's nothing new. You know, that's nothing that GPOS would invent. That's pretty uh, old principle that is now being adopted by many languages. Closure, Scala, and even Java 8 is similar. Um, so it all builds on data flow variables. Data flow variables are just plain variables, but variables that you can only assign value once. You know, that's enough. That's enough. It gives you a model where you have no race conditions, no line locks, and that are deterministic. Well, deterministic, right? You've seen non-deterministic program right, a short while ago. Now, non-determinism is the biggest enemy when you do concurrency. When you have deterministic deadlocks, then you can easily analyze them because you can reproduce them on your machine and you can look at the deadlock and investigate what went wrong. So this is a much bigger improvement. So if you've got a concurrent application with several tasks and there are some dependencies, so some task needs to read some data that another task creates or cal calculates. So it will pass you through a data But the variable can be only assigned value once. So it's empty at the, at the beginning. If you come and try to read the value, you get blocked. You get nothing back. You know, that's the semantics of data flow variable. If there's no value, you can't read it. If there is a value, you will get it. And you can only write value once. The variable introduces a very useful property in the scheme. It introduces partial extra partial ordering in that graph of execution of your tasks. So, the green part of that task two depends on the red part of task two, of task two obviously. You know, that's just sequentially organized in the same task. But now with the data flow variable there and the data going from task two to task one, you've got this extra dependency that blue has to happen after red finishes. So that's an extra thing that wasn't in that graph before. So you can now reason about that execution of that code. You know, if you have more complex execution, now you see, well, because the, the relationship, the ordering is transitive. So now we know green has to happen after blue. Blue has to happen after red. And if for some reason there's another data flow variable that introduces that red has to happen after green, well, then you know you have a deadlock, and it will always happen. So you can read. Now let's look at data flow variables, how they look in code, and what you can do with them. So here I've prepared an empty script. I've got a, a group with a sort of thread rule and two data flow variables. So now I can create a task that will, for example, write a value into the A data flow variable. Now once it writes a value into A, anybody who's listening for A will see the value. So we can have another task here, or wherever, wherever the, the, the data flow variable A is visible. And it can read value, or oh, using get is better. Oh, sorry, A. So it will read value from A. And then you can write it to, into B, let's say with, with, some, with some addition. Well, and now A can see that value. So it can happily log the value that it receives. Right, so now this is what we got. Joe and Dave was printed out. So this task in printed out B, which contained whatever was first written into A plus whatever uh, the, the task to add it to, to, to B after reading A. But the variables are not, the data flow variables can be obviously read by many parties. So even the main thread here can be listening for value in, in, in B. 
and do something once there is value in B. Or if it's not interested in the value, it can just join. So waiting until B is bound, and when it is, it will, it will continue. There's another quality that data flow variables have, and they allow you to register callbacks. So not only you can blockingly read the value, that would be a little bit too restrictive if, that's, if this was the only option, but you can register a callback. So you can say, A, whenever it has a value, then I want to do something with that value. So I might say, if there is a value, I want to print out the message, A has a value. Well, and the value is given as a parameter to the closure. So this handler, handler will be invoked whenever A becomes bound. And I can have more of these. And I, I can have another one waiting for B. So let's try now. Or to make it even more uh, appealing, I'll introduce a sleep here. So we'll see for three seconds after A gets bound before B gets bound. So we see you know, that it really happens in stages. But I guess you get the idea. You know, so A has been bound, so all handlers for A have triggered. And then in a while, B has been bound, so all handlers for B have been triggered. And promises also allow you to wait for more of them at the same time. So you could go when all bound. Oh, sorry. A and B. So we're interested in A and B. So when both A and, bound, a and B have a value, then we, we supply a, a function that needs to be triggered. So now it needs to take two arguments because we wanted two values. So when X and Y, so, so when A and B have value, then this function gets triggered. Print line both have a value. So this one gets triggered when both A and B has value, not earlier. Now the important quality of then and when bound is that they do not consume threats if they are passive. So they wait for the, the variable to be bound, they don't block your threads. And only when there is a value in A and B, then they will borrow a thread from a thread pool and do whatever they are supposed to do. And if your thread pool has only one thread, well then they will share that thread. So you can limit the parallelism by assigning a thread of proper size to, uh, to your computation. What you do, well, obviously you're in the group. Right, now I leave it up to the default, but you could be more picky and say how many threads you really want to use for this. But now look at this. What do you think task returns? That's a call to some method called task. You're passing closure as an argument. What do you get back? Any ideas? All uh, right, you're very close. You get a data flow variable. Well, you get a variable that's bound to the result of that task. We call it a promise. I sometimes use data flow variables and promises kind of interchangeable. Uh, in GPAS, they mean pretty much the same thing, maybe different look at the same thing. But yes, you're right. So you get back something that's called, that, that resembles future from Java. So it's an interface called promise, which is an interface the data flow variable provides. It's the reading part of the data flow variable because you're not supposed to bind it because it's the task who will bind it at some point. So here's the promise through which you can get hold of that the value that the task will produce. Well, in our case, it doesn't produce a value since it's, it's void. It's not, not returning anything, but if we make it return value and change it to promise for integer, so now we have a promise that eventually will have an integer in it and will represent the result of that asynchronous activity, of that task. So now we can obviously call uh, then on it and register a callback that will do whatever, whatever you want with, with, with the result. Uh, of, of that task. Okay, good. Now, what do you think this returns? A dot then 
You call A dot then and you pass in a closure, so you register a call back. What do you get back? Sorry? Right, well, you get, no, you, the, the value that is in A, you get it inside the handler, here. But what do you get in the, oh, sorry, on top. But what you get in the main thread is, again, a promise, you know, because here when you call A dot then, you only register a callback, you still don't know the value of A because it's too early, you know, the value of A will be specified sometime later by, by some other thread, so you can't get back that value, nobody knows it. But you, can, you get back a promise for the result of the handler. Uh, sorry, for, for this handler. You know, so whatever this handler, handler returns, say 20, will at some point appear in, you know, in either promise.get. So this will block and eventually give you the value 20, which this handler returns at some point. So it won't give you the value of A, which will be Joe and Dave. It will come as an argument here in, 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 that in the handler. But whatever that handler returns will then be passed on to your, you know, to, to R, to R. And then R can have another then handler telling that whenever that promise has a value, I want to do something with it. So now we can inline this. So notice this I'm chaining then handlers. So I'm saying whenever A has a value, do this. And whenever this finishes, do this. And whenever that finishes, well, do something, something else. Well, identically, you could do the same thing for when all bound. So when all bound returns, surprisingly, a promise. So even when all bound could, you know, if, you, if you're interested in whatever this handler will do, then you can add another then after it, or you could just use when bound for this, this promise queue, for this queue somewhere. So you see, you can combine promises together and uh, chain them to build asynchronous computation, computations, because each of the handlers in that chain will be executed asynchronously the previous more finishes. Pardon? Sure. Yeah, sure you can. I mean, I've, I've got, got two of them, them right? I've, I've got, got two tasks running, running where A has a value, but I could add more. A then I could do 20 of them. Or I could, in a for loop, I could iterate 20 times and add different 20, 20 different handlers. So that would work. So basically, you chain closures of functions with then. And the first one has to be asynchronous, like task, for example. And you can also handle errors. So if there is an error somewhere along the way, now that exception will propagate through then. It. You know, the last but one line has a print or error handler, and that one will catch the exception. It's that accepts an exception, so it will it will it will handle it, maybe replace it with a, with some value. So then, further into the chain, you might redefine what value will continue. So you can handle errors, or you just let the exception pass all the way down, and then you will get that exception rethrown. Uh, if uh, like. For example, if we had here, if we throw an exception, whatever, and we had, and if we had a data flow variable waiting for, for, for this to finish, for the, whole, for the whole chain, then calling result.get would throw exception at you. So the exception would, pr would propagate to you from those asynchronous activities into the thread that's, that's waiting for the result. Well, in the same process, you mean JVM process? Uh, in the same, or in the same thread, or task, you mean? Yeah, all right, yeah, they all reuse the same group. You could redefine it, I, I think then takes an argument. 
takes, uh, takes an argument, p group or threat pool, so you can be specific if you want for that particular handler if you want, handler if you want to be if you, you want to choose a different one than the one that it started in. So back to um, back to our registration forms with tasks. Having this functionality, I would implement it this way. So I've got a collection of closures to call. Now I would call collect on it. So I would collect the promises. Well, and then with all, and, and then eventually I would feed values into. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, no, and then I would either process the the result, the promises, all of them, you know, calling get on them. Or I could use when all bound on on those um, on those uh, promises to, to to get all the results. Now, looking at the data flow variable, there's an interesting and useful generalization of a data flow variable, and that's the data flow channel. So now instead of just one value, you can pass in many values. And now the qualities of um, partial ordering are propagated into subsequent calls. So now you know that you know, red, to hap red has to happen before blue, but and yellow has to happen before green, because we need to resolve that the uh, yellow uh, part will compute. So instead of just one shot values, you've got a channel of multiple values. And uh, GPAS also gives you a synchronous variant of this, where even the, the writer into a channel is blocked until the reader consumes the value. So that allows you to have the producer and the consumer proceed in, in phases synchronously. So an example of, of using this, if we just take the, the example we've seen earlier and add the data flow queue to it, for progress monitoring. So now, we, instead of, uh, well, on top of the data flow, we have a channel that the task will write a value into each time it processes a form. And there, should, and there could be another task reading from that queue and updating a visual progress bar. So if we go to this example, that's exactly this piece of code. So when we run it, now we have uh, concurrent tasks processing the form and sending values into a channel. And then we have another task monitoring that channel, reading stuff off it and updating a visual progress bar. So we know, you know how far we are in that com computation. So that here's the writing part. So you know, here we write into a channel, just the same way we would bound the data flow variable, just add a value to that queue. And there's another task running here, which repetitively takes the progress queue and reads values from that. So it reads values and updates the progress bar. So now we have two tasks, independent, just connected through a queue, one writing to that queue and the other one reading from that queue. So that's a pretty powerful mechanism how you can combine multiple tasks together. So not only you are interested in the partial results or complete results through promises, but you might also be interested in you know, sending multiple repetitive data through channels. Now, reading from a channel, well, if you have only one channel to read, it's easy while well, you read from that channel. But what if your task needs to read from multiple channels? Now, you pick a channel, you read from that channel, and there's nothing in there, then you block until there is somewhere in there, something in there. But sometimes you might be interested in messages from multiple channels, potentially coming from different producers, and you don't really care which one the message came from, you just need to get the next message from whoever it came from. So then you can use something like select. So you create a select, you give it all channels to monitor, and then you ask that select for the next value. The select will select you know, an, any available value from any channel and give it back to you. So that's a useful machine mechanism for handling multiple input channels that you need to, to read from. OK, well, this will be very exciting to continue in. However, We've got the second part. We've got the data parallelism as well. So for the next 20 minutes, we'll focus on that part of that categorization graph. So data parallelism, let's start with geometrical decomposition. That's the easier one. And surprisingly, that's the part of GPAS that most people use and most people understand. Uh, that's the thing about parallel collections. You know, ge geometrical decomposition is more complex than just collections, but GPAS can only help you with this. So let's focus on this. Uh, you all know Groovy. 
So we know commands or methods that you can use to process collections. Now, if you append parallel, you've got a parallel versions of them. First, you have to create a thread pool, but then you can use these parallel uh, methods to process your collections in parallel. Now, there are two ways to process collections in parallel. The first one is the one that's probably more, more familiar to you. Well, the second one is the one that's more efficient. You know, the thing is that if you want to process collection in parallel in GPASS, well, we delegate to the underlying full join implementation, which takes your collection, rebuilds it into a tree, and then runs full join on it. And then after that, the algorithm will reconstruct back to you, which is not very efficient if you change multiple methods in this case. So in the second case, you avoid that. You just build a parallel data structure calling dot parallel. Then you call map, reuse, filter, and these methods to transform your collection into another collection or into, into a single value. And if you still need a collection run under that collection, we'll reconstruct collection for you. So I prefer the second one if you want to chain multiple methods. That's the that's kind of the takeaway from this part. However, when using parallel collections, I noticed there are three sort of complaints or problems that I discovered. Now the first one. People frequently complain that the algorithm is not, not any faster, or even it is slower than this original sequential implementation they try to replace. And well, this is C++, you know, this is not Groovy, so it's not only Groovy, uh, not only a problem in Groovy. So each time you apply parallelism to your code, think twice whether it pays off. You know, there is certainly a big overhead in rebuilding a collection into a tree. So if you if you then just adding then don't expect uh, an, a performance improvement. And also, the, the CPU kind of cheats on you. If, if you try, if you, if you run sequential code, just sequential iteration, you know, computation on that on, on the computer, you realize it speeds up, almost it doubles the uh, speed. While if you run if you run a algorithm, then it will keep the base frequency where, you know, at the base level. So benchmarking is always tricky with parallel code. Well, then two kind of common error patterns I discovered. Well, the first one probably uh, stems out from the fact that we've been all trained in the sequential world. So people tend to use each parallel as sort of a replacement for a for loop. Uh, for loop. So they iterate through a collection and then update some, some stuff up there, some accumulator. Now, first, if you attempted to use each parallel, think twice. That's probably not the best choice. And if you do use each parallel and access something outside of that scope of, of that each parallel, then you're almost certainly doing something wrong. Right? So that's like the heuristic you could, you could follow. Well, and the second pattern for sort of improper use of parallel collections in GPASS was this one. You're reading data from a stream, from a file, from a network, and you attempted to build a collection and then run parallel collection algorithm on that collection. That's the wrong way. No, don't do it that way. Instead of running you know, these steps, step one, step two, step three, on each element inside each parallel, build a pipeline. Build a pipeline like this, where well, step one, step two, step three are just you know, steps in the pipeline. And then sequentially, as you load data from disk, feed them into that pipeline. You avoid the problem of having too much data, which doesn't fit in memory. And also, you don't waste the initial time when you're still loading data from disk, and you're just storing in memory, and you're not processing it, because parallel, the parallel collection algorithm cannot start before the collection is completely loaded. Well, this algorithm can start from the beginning. You know, the first, the first guy you load from, from this, you feed it, it immediately gets processed by step one. So and as, you, as you keep loading, you know, the elements, all the elements that you load will be at different stages of that pipeline, but all of them will be processed concurrently. So like if you have a continuous integration server, you know, it loads the first project and starts building a you know, second project and a third project. So as the same, uh, if you take a snapshot, that the first project that started early is now being deployed, for example, is at the last stage, while the second project is, you know, the, is slightly later, is now being packaged, and the, the third project is being compiled. And you know, the pipeline doesn't have to be straight. It can fork and join later. 
So, so we, we see, see like the, the, the third project is being compiled and documentation is, is being built and whatever is being done in parallel, you know, kind of part of the same stage of that pipeline. So this is the way to process streamed data, which gives us the last chapter of this talk, talking uh, where I would like to cover stream data. So how to cover these cases where you load data from some streamed data source, so you don't have it in memory. So the pipeline is a good way to do that. Uh, you've seen a kind of schema of how to do it. Now this is GPARS code how to do it. Back. We're referring back to the, to, the, to the example of those forms and submissions. So let's assume we're reading these submissions from, from a disk. So we sequentially feed them into the first channel. So we have two data flow queues. The first one is there so that we can feed values into it. And then with the pipe operator, just like in Unix shell, you just chain functions. So you say whenever there's something in the to process, I want that function to call process, to, to process that form. And once it's done processing it, it will pass it on to the next function in the chain, which is validating it. And whenever that one finishes, whatever comes up will go into the validated channel. Well, and that's the channel I'll be reading. And that's the, the one I'll be consuming and using, because that's the transform data I need to use for something else. So it's basically chaining methods and or chaining functions, and each of the functions, uh, each of the functions will be invoked repetitively whenever data shows up on the input. And again, you can run it with a thread pool of any number of threads you like. You know, the, the, the functions they will return thread back to the thread pool, so they don't consume threads if they are idle. You know, that's that's a very on any, any concurrency framework. It must not consume threads if it's not busy. So this is how the, well, schematically, this is how what we built with our pipeline DSL. This is how it looks like, right? So we've got three channels. Two of them we created explicitly. One of them is kind of hidden behind the pipeline operator. And then we have, uh, and then we have two uh, blue, nodes which represent these repetitively called functions and I would call them operators. That's a term useful for these guys. So we've got channels connecting operators. In our case in a streamed, in a chained kind of uh, uh, pipeline. So here is code for this, the real code. Uh, sorry, no this one, this one. So we have two channels and now we have the pipeline, through the pipeline we connect this function and with the next pipeline we connect this function. Now, the pipeline is just a shorthand for a method call, chain width, so instead of the pipeline operator you use chain width. But there obviously there are more methods than chain width, uh, more methods, but they have no operators, so you have to use method call instead. So you could, instead of chaining, you could do split. So whatever comes through that to process channel will then split into several branches to other operators. So you can have now more parallel branches. Or you could call separate. So it will take the message, the form in our case, that arrives, and then using the supply function will cut it into pieces and send each piece to a different branch. Or you could Instead, you could merge with another channel. So you could now merge code, com uh, data coming from a different channel into just one piece of data and, uh, and, and act on it. And there are more methods like this. So thanks to them, then you can, instead of building just straight pipelines, you can build more complex data for processing networks where you have channels going, you know, several operators so they can go across the network and they can go backwards. Uh, in general, uh, but you know, there are limits to this, obviously, with this AP, this fluent, oh, so sorry, fluent, with this pipeline uh, DSL, uh, you can only get so far. There, there are some constructions that would be pretty clumsy to create this way, so in that case, you probably need to go step down a little bit and take the underlying components and wire them by hand. So you just take channels and top 
and wire them together yourself, like in this last example. So again, the same case, the same code, but this time wired together by hand. Right, so now I have to create three, three channels, not just two. I also need the intermediate channel, I need to create it by hand. And now I need to create two operators. So I say, well, the first operator takes as an input the two process channel, this guy, and as an output the process channel. And this is the function that I, that I want to call, this, you know, this closure is the function I want to call each time there is data coming in. And since operator in general case can have multiple outputs, I don't take the output value of that function, but I have a special bind output uh, method call to kind of bind output of that function to some uh, to the output channel. So that's why this is why I'm not taking the, the, the result of that function. Similarly, the second operator ta takes the processed channel, which is output of the first one, and outputs into the validated channel. That is the channel I, I am consumed down downstream myself. So this is wiring operators and channels by hand, which gives you the full flexibility, but obviously at the cost of uh, writing more code. Well, data flow networks are gaining some popularity in the industry. They, they typically use for data mining or some sort of data processing or compression and things like that. And there are even frameworks that restrict where you can wire operators. You know, there are frameworks for data flow processing that, uh, that allows you only to have, only allows operators to have single output or single input and single output. They only allow certain ways you can Operators. Like there's a framework that only allows three things. Like you can have a sequence of operators, you can have fork and join, and you can have backwards loop, nothing else. So it gives you, it, so it restricts you in some way, but on the other hand, it gives you uh, easy, uh, it gives you more, a more easy way to easy ways to reason about your networks and understand what they do. Well, GPers at the moment. Gives you full flexibility, but maybe there will be some networks that will, uh, some some frameworks on, built on top of it that will kind of restrict what you can do to give you some other sort of benefits. Okay. Well, the very last demonstration I have here is a very untypical example of data flow operator usage. So here it is running. Can anybody recognize what this is? Game of life, right? So this is a you know kind of school example of you know very primitive simulation of bacteria living in a grid and uh, surviving or not surviving depending on how many neighbors they have. But this is a parallel variant of it implemented with data flow operators. And so each cell that you see on the screen is effectively a data flow channel, but in our case not a queue but a broadcast that kind of whatever value. It out to whoever's interested. interested. You know, so you can broadcast to many listeners as they are interested. And behind the scenes, there's a grid of, of the same size uh, of operators. Oops. Something happened. Okay. Simulation went a little bit wild. So I'll try without a slide, but you get you, you saw the simulation, you can imagine that grid in your head. So you know you've got this grid of channels broadcasting the value they have, and then the exactly the same size of exactly the same size of the grid of operators. And each operator monitors the corresponding cell plus its surroundings, because these cells on these cells it depends. The, 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 the cell depends, oh, it's, sur it's survival depends on the surrounding, the neighboring, neighboring cells. So the operator monitors the cell plus the surroundings, so it takes all the values, calculates true or false, whether that particular, the corresponding cell should, su should survive or not, and writes it back into that channel. And you know that value is immediately broadcast again, so all the operators that are interested in that particular cell will see it, so again will recalculate, and so on and so forth. Plus there's a heart beating. Uh, channel that kind of makes all the operators to progress in uh, in uh, synchrony. Yeah. 
Yeah, okay. But, but you know, I need to fix it. it. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. So, so that was quite a wide run, wasn't it? But, but we, we only covered about a third of what GFAS can do, really. Although it doesn't look from the slide, but you know, there's more hidden behind, you know, these, even the yellow guys. So have time to explore them all. But now you should have a picture of you know, what fits where, at least partially. And if you do that, I accomplish my mission here. I'd like to finish with a quote of uh, John Kellidge, who helped us a lot with uh, our GPASS project. He says, parallelism is not hard, multi-threading is. And I think this is kind of the core message of why we do uh, GPASS. I think we have time for some questions. So if you want to ask something, now we have a chance. Okay, if not, I'll be here till like five today. So if you want to talk to me, then grab me anyway in, you know, in the lobby. Uh, it was my pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me.